Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Christopher sent me a note, and I've been involved in a case that paralleled this quite a bit. So it's an f- interesting case to talk about. From KFOR out of Oklahoma, mechanic still refusing to pay for damage to a woman's car after judge's order. A court has ruled against him in favor of the customer, and the guy won't pay up. So Spencer Humphrey wrote this. Woman says a mechanic is refusing to pay for damage. He caused her car even after a judge ordered him to pay. She says, I don't have the funds to keep investing in this car. I'm done. So News 4 first interviewed the woman back in January after she'd taken her car to a mechanic in Shawnee. She dropped her car off at the man's shop back in November to have the timing chain replaced. She paid him $700 for the repair up front. And she said the mechanic told her the repair would take no more than a week. She told News 4 that the mechanic kept delaying the release of her car, giving her numerous excuses. So in January, she had her car inspected by a different mechanic who told her it appeared that the first mechanic had done more than just to attempt repairing of the timing chain. He had somehow damaged the engine to the point that the car was undrivable and would take thousands of dollars to fix properly. Now, I know that some mechanics already hammering away at their keyboards. We don't know exactly what happened here. I don't know if the guy pulled the engine out of the car or if he simply got at the timing chain by by taking stuff off it inside. And we also don't know if it was put back together again to where it should have run properly. Because if he didn't finish the timing chain repair, obviously it wouldn't run properly, right? So let's not get heavily into the speculation about what condition the car is in now. But the woman said it was a butcher job. So TV station talked to the mechanic back in January and asked him if he took apart more of her engine than she'd been off, you know, she'd authorized him to do. And the mechanic said, well, yeah, when I see all the sludge and stuff, the codes and stuff, it all had in it, had all the uh, codes for the correlation. Everything was out of sync. Bad. Now, I've never heard of somebody talking about the codes for the correlation. If you know what that means, please tell me. But uh, he told TV station the engine was covered in oil sludge and needed to be taken apart further and cleaned. So they asked him, did you ask the customer if she'd be okay with you doing additional work? And he said, well, I wasn't going to charge her any extra for that. She just went crazy. So after that story aired, the woman took the man to small claims court where a judge ruled in her favor back in March. The judge said in the state of Oklahoma, if you do unauthorized work to a customer's vehicle, that you were responsible for any damages that occurred. So on March 14th, the judge handed down an order telling the mechanic he had to pay the customer $3,965 for the damage he caused due to the unauthorized repairs. So the woman thought, well, I've been made whole because I got this judgment now. She said, I figured if a judge said you were ordered to pay something, you had to pay it. But so far, the mechanic has shown no signs he actually plans on paying or anything. She said, I have numerous text messages asking him to please make arrangements to get it paid, and it shows that he's read the message, but he hasn't responded. So a TV station swung by the shop and asked the man why he hadn't paid the customer yet. And he said, she's going to have to talk to my lawyer. So they asked him, you have a lawyer? And he said, I did not destroy that engine. Okay, but a judge ruled that you did, so do you have a lawyer that you've retained? They asked him. To which the man said, I'm talking to my lawyer. TV station said, what's your lawyer's name? And the man said, everybody will find out. He then went on to tell the TV station is filing an appeal. Court records show no appeals have been filed so far. Now, this was a small claims action, I believe, as is described here. And I will admit that small claims actions vary wildly from state to state. Generally speaking, a small claims action is where you go into court you're usually capped at a dollar amount. It could be $5,000, it could be $10,000, but you cannot get more than that. There's certain things that cannot be handled in small claims, such as claims of equity, asking a court to order somebody to do something other than pay money, uh, or divorces, or landlord-tenant actions to evict somebody. And it's usually just money damages below a certain amount. So if you go into small claims court, you can sue someone in small claims court. Quite often, they can remove it to regular court because they don't agree to the restrictions of the court. However, if they agree and the hearing is held, both parties are held to a certain set of rules of small claims court. 
quite often those rules are that there is no appeal. Quite often the rules are that there is no attorney on either side. If you want an attorney, go to regular court. Uh, if you want to appeal maybe, go to regular court. So if you agree to go to small claims court, quite often you agree to waive those things. So interestingly, the man now says he has an attorney and he's planning an appeal. <laughs> Which sounds like your case probably wasn't appropriate for small claims court based on what your defenses are going to be or something. I don't know. Uh, but it reminds me, back in the day, um, one of my relatives worked for a rather large entity and they entered into binding arbitration with somebody. And after the other side lost, they said they were going to appeal. <laughs> Hypothetically, it's possible to appeal a binding arbitration. But the, the grounds for appeal are so narrow that it's almost impossible. So uh, it was comical in that setting, trust me. But here, you've got somebody who had a hearing in small claims court. Now, now let's just play devil's advocate. If you said, Steve, is there any possible way this guy's got a case? Well, let's suppose that he never knew there was a case. He wasn't served with it, for instance. So he's not aware there's a case against him and somebody goes to court and he doesn't know about it. That's, that's a decent argument. But if he was there or if he was served and didn't show up, it's a whole different thing. Whole different thing. So I've had a lot of people contact me and they say, Steve, I got a judgment against somebody in small claims court and they won't pay. Oh, that's common. That's extremely common. Very common. Happens all the time. And so unfortunately, you will have to go through the collection process and so I'll give you an example. I told you I'd had cases similar to this before. Uh, I got a judgment against a guy uh, for about eight or nine thousand dollars, and the guy wouldn't pay it. And the time for an appeal came and went. It was not a small claims court case; it was simply a district court case, and he didn't pay it. Uh, and so I set him for a creditor's exam. And you can subpoena somebody and force them to come into court and testify under oath about their assets and their liabilities and where they work and where the bank accounts are. And it can be very intrusive and annoying. And most people, when they get hit with a subpoena for a creditor's exam that I've dealt with, have simply paid the judgment to avoid it. But I had one guy who paid zero. Uh, time came and went for the appeal, served him with the uh, subpoena, and I did not do it. A court officer did it. This is important for the story. So the guy gets served with a subpoena for a creditor's exam. I go to court that day for the exam. The guy doesn't show up. Judge waits about half an hour. Judge turns to his bailiff and goes, did you serve him? Bailiff goes, yes, I did. Judge goes, okay, I'm going to issue a bench warrant. And I said, Your Honor, what does that mean in practical terms? He goes, we'll put a bench warrant out for him. And when we pick him up, when he gets picked up, um, we'll drag him in here. You can have your creditor's exam. I said, okay. I go, are you going to go looking for him? And he goes, not at first. He goes, but if it doesn't, you know, doesn't turn up on our system somewhere, eventually, yeah. So I said, okay. And I, I told my client that and went back to my office. A couple weeks later, Friday afternoon, I get a phone call from a court. I look at the caller ID. It's a phone call from a court. And I get on the phone, and the clerk says, um, just to let you know, we picked the guy up on the creditor's exam uh, bench warrant. And I said, oh, okay. Now what? And she goes, well, we're going to hold him until you can do the exam. How's Monday look for you? And I realized, oh, this guy's going to sit in jail Friday, Saturday, Sunday, until Monday morning for a creditor's exam. I said, Monday morning's fine. What time? She goes, 9 a.m. I said, okay. Monday morning, I go to court, and uh, they bring the guy in in handcuffs, and uh, they undo his handcuffs, and I got to do a creditor's exam. Got to ask him all kinds of questions. Uh, where do you work? Where do you bank? Uh, tell me about your various expenses and bills. Do you rent? How much is your rent? And now some people hearing this think that this is somehow unfair or cruel. But remember, the guy owes my client a bunch of money. He's refusing to pay it. Just what are you going to do about it? Don't challenge an attorney to do something about getting you to pay money. Because I get to ask those questions. And sure enough, if I want to, I can send over a notice to garnish your wages for instance, or I can go after your tax returns. I, I mean, there's all kinds of things that people can do. Just pay it. Just pay it. So here you got a guy who's had a judgment entered against him for what appears to be $3,965. He says that's unfair, but it appears there's already been a, a, a trial on this. It's over. It's over. So unless there's something inherently wrong with the process that led to that judgment, i.e., like I said, if he wasn't served and didn't know about the proceedings or something, but if, if he was there 
in small claims court and got the judgment against him. This bit about a lawyer and an appeal is what my dad would say is a day late and a dollar short. So <laughs> I heard that more often than you could ever imagine. So Christopher, thanks for sending it. We'll see what happens if it pops up back in the news. Spencer Humphrey wrote that for KFOR. Mechanic still refusing to pay for damage to a woman's car after a judge's order and a small claims court lawsuit. Questions or comments? Put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. I will keep preaching this to myself and others. There are no problems, only projects.